One day you would say it and came to God and he asked to test Brother Joe. He said to God, just take down your head and I will steal his soul. So God said yes and Job confessed, I'll trust the Lord all the way. In the Bible we're told that he came for the gold and he won the victory that day.
The Gospel according to St. John. The Gospel according to St. John. John 12. John 12. Then Jesus, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, which had been dead, whom he raised from the dead. There they made him a supper, and Martha served. But Lazarus was one of them that sat at the table with him. Then took Mary a pound of ointment of spikenard, very costly, and anointed the feet of Jesus, and wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the odor of the ointment. Then saith one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, which should betray him, Why was not this ointment sold for three hundred pence and given to the poor? This he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief, and had the bag, and bare what was put therein. Then said Jesus, Let her alone. Against the day of my burying hath she kept this. For the poor always ye have with you, but me ye have not always. Much people of the Jews therefore knew that he was there, and they came not for Jesus' sake only, but that they might see Lazarus also, whom he had raised from the dead. But the chief priests consulted that they might put Lazarus also to death, because that by reason of him many of the Jews went away and believed on Jesus. On the next day much people that were come to the feast, when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, took branches of palm trees and went forth to meet him, and cried, Hosanna! Blessed is the King of Israel that cometh in the name of the Lord. And Jesus, when he had found a young ass, sat thereon, as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, thy king cometh, sitting on an ass's colt. These things understood not his disciples at the first. But when Jesus was glorified, then remembered they that these things were written of him, and that they had done these things unto him. The people therefore that was with him when he called Lazarus out of his grave and raised him from the dead bear record. For this cause the people also met him, for that they heard that he had done this miracle. The Pharisees therefore said among themselves, Perceive ye how ye prevail nothing? Behold, the world is gone after him. And there were certain Greeks among them that came up to worship at the feast. The same came therefore to Philip, which was of Bethsaida of Galilee, and desired him, saying, Sir, we would see Jesus. Philip cometh and telleth Andrew, and again Andrew and Philip tell Jesus. And Jesus answered them, saying, The hour is come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. He that loveth his life shall lose it, and he that hateth his life in this world shall keep it unto life eternal. If any man serve me, let him follow me, and where I am, there shall also my servant be. If any man serve me, him will my father honor. Now is my soul troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour, but for this cause came I unto this hour. Father, glorify thy name. Then came there a voice from heaven, saying, I have both glorified it, and will glorify it again. The people, therefore, that stood by and heard it said that it thundered. Others said, An angel spake to him. Jesus answered and said, This voice came not because of me, but for your sakes. Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out, and I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. This he said, signifying what death he should die. The people answered him, We have heard out of the law that Christ abideth forever. And how sayest thou, the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is this Son of Man? Then Jesus said unto them, Yet a little while is the light with you. Walk while ye have the light, lest darkness come upon you. For he that walketh in darkness knoweth not whither he goeth. While ye have light, believe in the light, that ye may be the children of light. These things spake Jesus, and departed and did hide himself from them. But though he had done so many miracles before them, yet they believed not on him, 
that the saying of Isaiah the prophet might be fulfilled, which he spake, Lord, who hath believed our report, and to whom hath the arm of the Lord been revealed? Therefore they could not believe, because that Isaiah said again, He hath blinded their eyes and hardened their heart, that they should not see with their eyes, nor understand with their heart, and be converted, and I should heal them. These things said Isaiah when he saw his glory and spake of him. Nevertheless, among the chief rulers also many believed on him. But because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue. For they loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. Jesus cried and said, He that believeth on me believeth not on me, but on him that sent me. And he that seeth me seeth him that sent me. I am come a light into the world, that whosoever believeth on me should not abide in darkness. And if any man hear my words and believe not, I judge him not. For I came not to judge the world, but to save the world. He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. For I have not spoken of myself, but the Father which sent me. He gave me a commandment, what I should say and what I should speak. And I know that his commandment is life everlasting. Whatsoever I speak, therefore, even as the Father said unto me, so I speak. May God help us to be doers of the word. Amen. Praise the Lord. I welcome everyone to our Bible study tonight in Jesus' name. And I pray it will be an enriching time for every one of us. Are you hear that? Amen. Yeah. Father, we thank you for the Bible study. Thank you for all your children, members, ministers who are here tonight. And in all the various districts and groups and everywhere online, and all the states and all the regions, everywhere we're hearing the word together in Africa and beyond. We're asking, Lord, tonight you open the eyes of everyone to behold wondrous things out of your word in Jesus' name. Enlighten us, Lord. I will pray it will not be studied just for the head, it will be for the heart of everyone in Jesus' name. I will pray, Lord, the grace to abide in the world, the strength to be obedient to the world. You grant to everyone tonight in Jesus' name. Keep us awake and help us, Lord, to receive everything you are sending to every one of us. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. And the people of God said, as you know, we are studying the epistle of Paul to the Corinthians. Tonight, we are looking at verses 9 all through to 23. Look at verse 9, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 9. For we are laborers together with God. Ye are God's husbandry. Ye are God's building. For we and laborers together with God. Paul the Apostle has been speaking about himself, the Apostle, and then Apollos, who was watering what he had already planted. And he wanted the Corinthian believers to understand that Paul, the planter, Apollos, the waterer, that they were labor laboring together with God that there shouldn't be any division, any disunity, any disaffection between Paul and Apollos. But the Corinthian believers have not there, they have not understood very well. And that's why they were carnal in their understanding. They were carnal in their expression. They were carnal in their affection. They were carnal in their response to the word of the Lord. 
That's why they said, this one said, I'm of Paul. Another one said, I'm of Apollos. Another one said, I'm of Sivas. That means I'm of Peter. Other people said, I don't even recognize any human leader. I am of Christ. And then Paul the Apostle asked them, is Christ divided? Is the Savior divided? Is our Lord divided? Is the Son of God who sent us to you and gave us different ministries, some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and some teachers, this same Christ and this same Lord who has given all these ministers and all these shepherds and pastors to us is that Christ divided and he wanted to bring them back together so that they will have the real understanding that whether the word of salvation is coming from Paul or the word of uh, strengthening is coming from Apollos, everything is still one because all scripture is given to us by the inspiration of God. And everything coming from Paul, coming from Apollos, coming from Severus, coming from the apostle, coming from the prophet, coming from the evangelist, coming from the pastor, coming from the teacher, everything is profit profitable profitable unto doctrine and profitable unto rebuke and profitable unto instruction profitable unto correction so that God will use all those ministers to bring God to perfection and will become truly furnished unto every good work and that's why he emphasizes now and he says for we all the preachers for we all the ministers we all the pastors we are laborers together with god one we're laboring with god one two we're laboring with one another and we have one purpose we recognize one thing that ye are god's husbandry and ye are god's building and then he tells us in verse 10 in verse 10 he says according to the grace of god which is given unto me as a wise master builder i have laid the foundation and another builders thereon you know what is emphasizing somebody lays the foundation an apostle lays the foundation and then another person a pastor a teacher may come after that and then he builds thereon he says let every man that take heed, let that he buildeth thereon. Let everyone, everyone that comes later as a pastor, later as a teacher, or later as a counselor, or later as a helper, let everyone take heed how he buildeth thereon. That's why we're looking at the word tonight building together with God in view of eternity. The apostle is building and is building with God and he has eternity in view and he has never dying souls in view. He has the sinners in view. He has the saints in view and he ministers while looking at their destiny and looking at their calling in the light of eternity. A teacher comes along after that, a helper comes along after that, a supportive minister, a supportive ministry comes after that and is building on the foundation that the apostle has laid and he does that in the light of eternity. He's talking about all of us as members, as ministers. He's talking about the preacher and the people of God. He's talking about everyone that contributes anything to the building and to the growing and to the edifying of the body of Christ that we understand we ought to build with God and we understand we ought to build with eternity in view tonight building together with God in view of eternity we're going to divide the message to three parts number one the foundation received by wise master builder the foundation received by the wise master builder there is a builder but then there ought to be an architect there ought to be someone who has made the construction 
who has given the principle, who has given all the precepts that we ought to follow. And then a builder comes along, he wants to build the kingdom. He wants to build the church. He wants to build every family. He wants to build every individual that comes into the kingdom of God and he looks at the pattern. He looks at what the Lord has laid down. And as a wise builder, a wise master builder, he follows the pattern and he lays the foundation and then he builds on the foundation. Point number one, the foundation received by the wise master builder. Point number two, the fire to reveal the worthy or worthless ministry. Everything we do is a ministry. Those of us who support, those of us who teach, those of us who counsel, those of us who lead other people, it's all ministry. So ministries are worthy of note and they are worthy of their calling. Other ministries are worthless. Other ministries are profitable. Other ministries add nothing positive. They add nothing to the lives of the church, the lives of the families, and the lives of the members of the church. And the fire will test everything that we do. The fire will test it even now as we go along. And the fire will test at the end of time. The fire that reveals the worthy ministry or the worthless ministry. Point number three, the foolishness residing in all worldly wise members. Worldly wise members. Some of the members at Corinth, they dwelt and they rejoiced in Greek philosophy and in Greek wisdom. And the Lord wanted to use Paul the Apostle to enlighten them to educate them and to show them the way, open their eyes to the very fact that worldly wisdom in the things of God, worldly wisdom in the ministry, worldly wisdom in our service to the Lord is foolishness in the sight of the Lord. And because it is foolishness, it will not be rewarded by the Lord. The foolishness residing in all worldly wise members. We come to point number one now. That's the foundation received by the wise master builder. We're looking at First Corinthians chapter 3 and we're reading from verse 10. In First Corinthians chapter 3, reading from verse 10, according to the grace of God, which is given unto me, as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation to come into the ministry. We need the grace of God. We need salvation before service. We need sanctification before service. And if we're going to be saved by grace, you are saved through faith and that not of yourself it is the gift of god and paul the apostle said i received the grace of god number one to be saved you're going to serve the lord you're going to preach the gospel you're going to edify the church you're going to be a builder together with god god is holy God is righteous and God is upright. A sinner cannot unite with God to build anything in the kingdom of God. A sinner may go to seminary. A sinner may read the Bible through and through. If he has not been saved, if he doesn't have the grace of God, he cannot join together with God, he cannot partner with God and build anything according to the grace of God which is given unto me. The grace comes into somebody's life and makes him born again, saved first according to the grace of God which is given unto me. It is the same grace after we are saved that gets us sanctified. Because God says, I am holy, 
and he says be ye holy therefore if we're going to minister along with God if we're going to build along with God if we're going to turn sinners to saints if we're going to turn the world unto the Lord if we're going to bring sinners into the kingdom of God and prepare them for eternity we ourselves must be prepared for eternity because without holiness no man shall see the Lord without holiness no man can serve the Lord without holiness no man can walk together with God number one salvation comes into our lives by the grace of God number two sanctification comes by the grace of God and then number three now service in the kingdom of God according to the grace of God which is given unto me sage according to the grace of God which is given unto me sanctified according to the grace of God which is given unto me brought into the service of God as a wise master builder I have laid the foundation and another builders thereon but let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon we're looking at three things there number one the master builders commitment to the foundation of God's temple the master builders commitment to the foundation of God's temple when we're talking about God's temple the word of God makes it very clear in this same chapter in verse 16 it tells us in verse 16 it says know ye not that ye are the temple of God and the spirit of God and that the spirit of God dwelleth in you you are born again and the spirit of God bears witness who are child of God you're sanctified and the spirit of God bears witness that he uproots the damaged nature he removes the stony heart and he gives you a heart of flesh and now you know by that presence of the spirit you know by that power of the spirit and you know by that enablement of the spirit you are a child of God you become the temple of God each individual believer is a temple of God and then together as a church will become the temple of God together as the temple of God it tells us in second uh, Corinthians chapter 6 reading from verse 16 second Corinthians chapter 6 we're looking at verse 16 and what agreement has the temple of God with idols for ye are the temple of the living God look at that ye are the temple of the living God you as an individual believer and you as a body the assembly the fellowship of the people of God together ye are the temple of the living God as God has said I will dwell in them plural I will dwell in them. It's talking about the collection, the assembly, the fellowship of real children of God as the temple. And then it says, and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Now the master, the master builder is committed to the foundation of that temple the temple of God in Isaiah chapter 28 verse 16 Isaiah chapter 28 we're reading from verse 16 it says therefore thus says the Lord God behold I lay in Zion a foundation a stone a tried stone a precious cornerstone a sure foundation he that believeth shall not make haste is telling us that God himself lays the foundation and if we're walking along with God if we're walking together with God we will not destroy the foundation we will not displace the foundation will not defile the foundation he lays the foundation and when he lays the foundation he wants us now as workers together as laborers together with God to walk along and to help to solidify and to help to give confidence to people on that foundation it tells us in first Peter 
chapter 2, reading from verse 6, 1 Peter chapter 2, we're looking at verse 6, wherefore also it is contained in the scripture, behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. He wants us to help sinners to turn away from their sin and to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. He wants us to help those who have turned already, those who have believed already, to be established on that foundation, the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's come to the second part of that now. That's the minister's consent, consecration to the foundation of his holy temple. We're coming back to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, and we're reading from verse 10. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 10, according to the grace of God, which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation and another builders thereon, another builders thereon. What does that mean? When the foundation has been laid in the church, the church of the living God, somebody lays that foundation. God used Paul the apostle to raise up the church at Corinth. And then after he led, others will have to come. There has to be a pastor in that local church. There has to be teachers in that local church. There will be counselors in that local church. That's what he's talking about. Others build thereupon. And then he says, let every man, whether a prophet or an evangelist, whether a pastor or a teacher, whether a counselor or a helper, anyone that comes to build on that foundation, let every man take heed how he buildeth on that foundation. When you look at our lives as individuals, you are a believer, you are a child of God. Somebody preached the gospel to you, a foundation has been laid. You knew nothing about Jesus Christ. You knew nothing about the Lord. You knew nothing about the Savior. Somebody came and he preached the word of God unto you and the foundation of our salvation, the Lord Jesus Christ has been laid and you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. Another now comes to build thereupon that he is somebody who is doing follow up, somebody who is counseling you, somebody who is telling you as a child of God, you are a new creature in Christ. This is the way to go, and that is the way to go. He is the one that is building thereupon, and it's saying, Let everyone the counselor, let everyone the one that is doing follow up, let everyone take heed what he buildeth thereupon. As we belong to the church, the Palai Bible Church, somebody at the central church laid the foundation and precept upon precept and line upon line, and that has been laid as a wise master builder. And now when we go to our local church, we go to our district church, we go to our region churches, and we go to our state churches, every branch, those people who are now preaching after we have laid the foundation, the foundation of that faith once forever, once for all, delivered unto the saints. That foundation has been laid. Let everyone in every local church, everyone in every district church take heed how he buildeth thereon. A child has been brought to the world by the father and the mother. And that child has been taught the word of the Lord. By the effort of the father and the mother, that child has come to know the Lord. The foundation of faith has been laid in the heart, in the life of that child. Now that child goes to school. And that child belongs to a this section, maybe children church, and maybe youth, uh, you know, youth section, or maybe campus. Now the people who are teaching those children, the people who are teaching those youths, and the people who are teaching those campus people, 
they are the people that build thereupon the foundation that have been laid in the hearts of those children let every man take heed how he build it thereon members of the church were come together and were taught the word of god and were taught on the sound foundation a chief cornerstone that should that is complete already and then we go to the house fellowship in a house fellowship all the house fellowship leaders they're building upon the foundation and it says let every house fellowship leader and let everyone that is helping us let them take it how they build upon that foundation you understand we have the church and then we have the women's section and the women's section is not in isolation by itself we have women fellowship and in those women fellowships what we're doing is we're building upon the foundation that have been laid already and paul the apostle said the wise master builder has already laid the foundation christ the savior christ the sanctifier and christ the shepherd and christ our substitute and christ the final sacrifice as we go to the women fellowship everything we're doing there we're supposed to build upon the foundation we're not teaching another thing about christ we're not teaching another thing about the family we're not teaching another thing that makes people to go away from the foundation that's why paul the apostles said already the foundation is laid and those of us who then support the ministry those of us who preach the word of god and those of us who help people to grow let every man and let every woman let every evangelist let every pastor let every preacher let every teacher take heed how he buildeth thereupon and then he tells us about the holy temple look at verse 17 there in verse 17 he says if any man defile the temple of god him shall god destroy for the temple of god is holy for the temple of god is holy that's the foundation we have laid that the temple of god is holy that's the foundation that is laid that god calls every member every child of god to holiness and anyone building thereupon should understand anything you build anything you counsel anything you teach anything you but you impart into the lives of the people must still go along with the holiness for the temple of god is holy which temple ye are in ephesians chapter 2 reading from verse 20 ephesians chapter 2 we're reading from verse 20 it tells us and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets jesus christ himself being the chief cornerstone is telling us that jesus christ is the chief cornerstone and then he gave the word to his apostles he gave the word to the ministers who came to lay up line upon line and precept upon precept and everything they did was to make us as the body of christ at the assembly of, ch of the children of god to build on the chief cornerstone who is the foundation and then he tells us in verse 21 there it says in whom all the building are fitly framed together all the building is talking now about all the believers as different parts as different blocks as different stones living stones joined together in such a seamless way that there is no division in such a seamless way that there is no disunity in such a good way there is no disaffection in whom all the building fitted frame together grows into an holy temple in the lord he wants the whole church as we're growing the adults and the youth and the children and the men and the women and the various sections as we're growing to grow together into an holy temple in the lord in verse 22 in whom ye also are builded together you see that 
in Christ were built together. You repent of your sin, you become a saved soul, you come into the kingdom of God, and then in Him, as you remain in Him, a new creature in Christ, a living stone in Christ, a believer in Christ, and the grace of God has come into your life, and you are now built together an habitation of God. God through the Spirit and habitation of God through the Spirit and he wants us to build upon the foundation of the Word of God everything he commanded everything he taught everything he has given unto us that would take that word without addition without subtraction and would build the lives of the people of God in the habitation of God look at number three here in number three here we're looking Looking at our meaningful comprehension of the foundation of his glorious temple. Our meaningful comprehension of the foundation of his glorious temple. We come to 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and we're reading from verse 11. For all the foundation can no man lay than that is laid which is Jesus Christ is saying Jesus Christ is the foundation is appointed by God is anointed by God is approved of God and he says since heaven has given approval and since God has given anointing and since God has said I lay in Zion a foundation a, a tried stone, a chief cornerstone, whosoever believes in him will not be confounded. He has laid that foundation, Jesus Christ. What foundation? The foundation of our salvation. He is Savior. There is no other Savior. Don't uh, introduce another personality, another entity to be our Savior. He is our Savior, and the people who have come on that foundation, they are saved. And they have the life of somebody who is saved and truly born again. Jesus Christ is the foundation. What does that mean? It's our sanctifier. And because it's a sanctifier, all that come to him must understand that if they're going to be on that foundation, abide in that foundation, there is a sanctification experience. It makes them holy saints in the sight of the Lord. It's telling us Jesus Christ is the foundation. He is the sacrifice, the final sacrifice. There's no other sacrifice. If anybody comes and introduces another animal sacrifice, and then he might refer to the Old Testament, all that is gone. Christ is the foundation. It's now the foundation of the gospel, and he is the final sacrifice. No other sacrifice that is necessary. He's talking about Jesus Christ at the foundation. He is the shepherd. And he says, my sheep hear my voice and they follow me. If we're laying the foundation and we're reassuring the believers that Christ is the foundation, we're making them to understand he is the shepherd and all the people who are built on that foundation and the foundation is established in them, they are a sheep. And they are not sheep that are scattered. They are sheep that are following after the shepherd. He's saying that Jesus Christ is the foundation. He is the Lord and the King. And because he's Lord and King, if we're really building on that foundation, all the people that have come into the kingdom, all the people that make that holy temple, they are following after him with absolute surrender. Absolute surrender. Because they recognize him as the foundation, as the Lord, and as the King. Jesus Christ is the foundation and he is the mediator. He is our advocate. There's no other person to stand between us and the Almighty God. 
an angel cannot stand between us and the almighty God. Any man, whatever his status, cannot stand between us and the almighty God because he is the mediator and he is the advocate. That's the foundation and we're making everybody to look unto Christ, the Christ who is the author and the finisher of our faith. You understand, it says in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. This Jesus, the foundation, is the Word, is the final Word, is the authoritative Word, and He is the Word that makes us to live and please God. There's no addition to that word. It is the foundation. It's complete. There's no subtraction from that word. He is the foundation and he is complete. That's why Paul the apostle emphasized by the spirit of God and he says for all the foundation can no man lay than that is laid which is Jesus Christ. You know, as Paul the Apostle was talking to those Corinthians, you might wonder, can anybody try endeavor to add or to shift or to bring another foundation? And look at uh, Second Corinthians, reading from chapter 11. Second Corinthians chapter 11, and we're reading from verse 3 here. Second Corinthians chapter 11, we're reading from verse 3. For I, but I fear, is he writing to these Corinthians? I fear lest by any means at the serpent be gouged Eve through the subtil through a subtlety. So your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. You see, they were being suffocated by the wisdom of the Greeks, by the, uh, by the wisdom of the Jewish people. And he said, I'm afraid of you, lest your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Look at verse 4. In verse 4 it says, it says, for if he that cometh preaches another Jesus he that cometh after we have laid the foundation after Paul the Apostle has laid the foundation of Christ as Savior Christ as sanctifier Christ as shepherd and Christ as the final sacrifice Christ as the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings and Christ as the mediator and the advocate and Christ as the word the final word the living word after that if he that cometh somebody who is coming as a helper, somebody who is coming as a supporter, somebody who is coming as a counselor, somebody who is coming as a pastor teacher. If he that cometh preacheth another Jesus whom we have not preached, or if ye receive another spirit which ye have not received, or another gospel which ye have not accepted, ye might well bear with him. Paul the Apostle was concerned that there will be people that will try to come and preach another Christ, another Savior. Grace is not enough. Faith is not enough. And the Spirit of God is not enough. They must bring another human element that changes the gospel and that defiles and destroys the gospel. In Galatians chapter 1, Galatians chapter 1, we're looking at verse 7. In Galatians chapter 1, reading from verse 7, which is not another. There's no other gospel and there's no other foundation. Anybody that comes and talks about another Christ, another Savior, another shepherd, another sanctifier, another shepherd, and talks about another king, another Lord, another mediator, another advocate, another what there is not another, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. And would pervert the gospel of Christ. In verse 8, now Paul the apostle says, but though we or an angel from heaven, those of us who have laid the foundation, and Paul the apostle said, by the grace of God, as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation. We're spoken about uh, Apollos. He has watered as well. Was talking about Peter, Stephen, uh, uh, Sivas. He has also helped. Though we 
Paul, Apollos, or Peter, or any other person, or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which ye, which we have preached unto you. Let him be accursed. He was so very sure about the foundation he has laid. He was so very sure about the authenticity, about the spirituality, about the infallibility of the word that he said, if anybody, even an angel from heaven, if he preaches any other gospel to you than that what you have got already about salvation, about sanctification, about holiness, about the power of the Holy Ghost, and about the things to come, about the future. If any other person brings any other gospel than what you have learned already, let him be a curse. In verse 9, in verse 9, it says, As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received let him be a cause we need to comprehend the gospel comprehend the foundation stand by the foundation abide by the foundation and then whatever we're building on to build according to the pattern revealed unto us in the word of god now we come to point number two in point number two the fire to reveal the worthy ministry of the worthless ministry we're coming to uh, first corinthians chapter 3 and we're reading from verse 12 first corinthians chapter 3 and we're reading from verse 12 now if any man builds upon this foundation if any evangelist if any pastor if any preacher if any teacher if any counselor if any supporter if any helper if any man builds upon this foundation gold silver precious tools wood his trouble verse 13 it says in verse 13 every man's work shall be made manifest every evangelist's work shall be made manifest every writer's work shall be made manifest every tele evangelist work shall be made manifest every preacher on the youtube shall be made manifest every author of every gospel book so to say every man's work shall be made manifest for the day shall declare each because it shall be revealed by fire it shall be revealed by fire the day of judgment every man's work shall be revealed by fire the day of reckoning every man's work shall be shall be revealed by fire the day of testing and the day of evaluating evaluating the work you're doing evaluating the work i'm doing every man's work shall be revealed by fire and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is in verse 14 it says in verse 14 if any man's work shall abide that which he has built thereupon he shall receive a reward and then in verse 15 it says if any man's work shall be burnt he shall suffer loss but he himself shall be saved yet so as by fire and then in verse 16 he tells us know ye not that ye are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. Then verse 17 says, in verse 17, if any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy, for the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. Three things we're looking at here. Number one, the reward of a Bible-based worthy ministry. We're coming to First Corinthians uh, chapter chapter three, reading from verse twelve all through to verse fourteen. In First Corinthians chapter three, verse twelve. Now, if any man builds upon this foundation gold, that's precious, and 
silver that's precious and then precious tools the wood he is stubble in verse 13 it says every man's work shall be made manifest for the day of reckoning the day of judgment the day of evolution shall declare it because it shall be revealed by fire and the fire shall try the fire shall test every man's work of what sort it is then in verse 14 it says if any man's work shall abide because it's built of gold it's built of silver is built of precious stone if any man's work abide if any teacher's work abide if any pastor's work abide if any supporters work abide if any woman's work abide if any leader's work abide which he has built thereupon he shall receive a reward he shall receive a reward there is a reckoning day there is a day when God is going to look at everything we have done in the kingdom everything we have emphasized in the kingdom everything we have preached to the people that were that were leading in the way of the Lord a reckoning day is coming in second Corinthians chapter 5 reading from verse 10 second Corinthians chapter 5 reading from verse 10 it says for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ we apostles we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ with the prophets and with the evangelists we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ we pastors and we teachers of the word we must appear before the judgment seat of Christ we leaders in the church and supporters in the ministry we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that every man every man every preacher every pastor every leader every worker that every man may receive the things done in his body everything we've done in the days of opportunity everything we've done in the days of ministry that everyone will receive what he has done in the body and then it says whether it be good or whether it be bad whether it be worthy or worthless whether it be useful or useless we shall receive for what we have done a reckoning day is coming in ecclesiastes chapter 12 ecclesiastes chapter 12 we're reading from verse 13 ecclesiastes chapter 12 verse 13 let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter fear god and keep his commandments fear god and keep his commandments for this is the whole duty of man are you a preacher fear god and keep his commandments are you a disciple of christ fear God and keep his commandment are you a pastor are you a preacher the Lord has sent forth the Holy Spirit has sent forth separate unto me Barnabas and Saul for the work whereunto I've appointed them you understand you must keep the commandment of the Lord and fear God while you are ministering are you supporting in any way you're a soul winner you're a house fellowship leader you're a worker you're a member of the body of Christ, a member of the church, and you're giving the bread of life and the water of life to other people, fear God and keep his commandments for this is the whole duty of man. Why? In verse 14, in verse 14, for God shall bring every work into judgment. For God shall bring every action into judgment. For God shall bring every contribution into judgment for God shall bring every part everything we have done he'll bring every work into judgment with every secret thing whether it be good or whether it be evil I pray our work will not be evil your work will not be worthless your work will be worthy of reward on that final day in Jesus name Let's come to number two here. The regrets after a burnt, worthless ministry. 
What if somebody, you know, is laboring and laboring and is expending energy, is expending all his uh, spiritual, uh, spiritual attributes and is expending money, everything he has is spending is, and is paid, is sweating uh, on the work and then is uh, building only wood, hay and stubble that fire will consume very easily let's come back to first corinthians chapter 3 reading from verse 12 first corinthians chapter 3 and we're reading from verse 12 now if any man builds upon this foundation the foundation that has been laid he doesn't destroy the foundation he doesn't tamper with the foundation he doesn't replace the foundation he still says he believes in the lord jesus christ and the foundation is still intact but now he builds gold silver precious stones wood he stubble then in verse 13 it says every man's work if it is wood if it is hay if it is stubble every man's work shall be made manifest for the day shall declare it because it shall be revealed by fire and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is then in verse 15 in verse 15 it says if any man's work which is, shall be burnt because it's wood combustible and because it's hay and because it's stubble if any man's work shall be burnt any counselor's work shall be burnt if any advisor's work shall be shall be burnt there are people they counsel others on marriage and they leave the foundation and they sympathize with the people because of what you are going through because of your suffering i identify with you who can say you should stay with such a man leave the man if i were you i would leave such a man is that according to the foundation of one man one wife until death do us part if we advise people if we counsel people according to our own misconceived idea where you don't have any job and the only job you've got now they say you will sell alcohol they say you will sell tobacco they say you will sell things that will poison the lives of people really i want to tell you we shouldn't do something like that but in your condition in your situation who will tell you not to go and do that it says if any man's work shall be burnt you counsel people in their own way you advise people to go in their own direction you bring in human ideology and human wisdom and then you tell people well um, if i were you i think i will consider this and what you are telling them to consider is contrary to the word of god if any man's work shall be burnt he shall suffer loss but he himself shall be saved yet so as by fire is telling us there the danger of teaching people that misleads them away from the kingdom of god in revelation chapter 3 we're looking at verses 1 and 2 revelation chapter 3 we're reading from verse 1 and unto the angel of the church in sadis right this thing says he that has the seven spirits of god and the seven stars i know thy works that thou hast a name that thou livest and art dead i know thy works in the plural he was still a leader he has not been removed from being a leader he was still the regular preacher pastor of that church in Sardis. and yet jesus said i know your works that you have a name that you live you are active you are here and there 
but you are dead because he was not contributing, he was not preaching, he was not leading the people to more life. If they got life before he got there, it's not leading them to abundant life, to spiritual life, to a holy life, and to a heavenly minded life. It's not leading them to grow in the things of life. But thou art dead. Look at verse 2. In verse 2 it says, Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that, that are ready to die. For I have not found thy works perfect before God. Wasn't it good that while the man was still alive, he had been building wood, his stubble, and the Lord came to confront him when he could still make correction? The Lord came to correct him when he could still turn around and do that which is right. He said, I have not found thy works perfect before God. As a house fellowship leader, as Christ found your work perfect before God, as a woman leader, leading women in your district, in your group, as God found your work perfect before the Lord, or you're not even doing anything at all. You're just there. You have a name that a woman leader and yet you are not contributing anything to the progress of the lives of the people spiritually. Or maybe you're a group pastor and uh, you never stay on any, on any district and you never preach anything. You might go around and go around. You're active, but the word, you're not giving out the word. You cannot point to people that got saved as a result of your ministration people that got sanctified as people that got a real biblical scriptural conviction as a result of your ministry or maybe you're an overseer as an overseer you just take your time anytime you want you get to the church the local church after all all the coordinators are there to preach all the group pastors are there all the other helpers and preachers are there and you are not up and doing there is no program there is nothing to move the people forward and the Lord is saying you have a name that you live a name a title but then I've not found your works perfect before God the fire will test and the judgment of God will test and the penetrating judgment of God will test on that day of reckoning where will you stand at that time Will you just be a person that have been there and yet nothing positive is contributed into the lives of the people we're leading? Go look at number three here. It says in number three, it talks about now what we ought to do, the reason for a bold, worthwhile ministry. We're coming back to First Corinthians uh, chapter three, and I'm reading from verse 16. First Corinthians chapter 3, and we're reading here from verse 16. Know ye not that ye are the temple of God? Don't you know that the church of God is the temple of God? Don't you know that everyone that is born again, that little child born again, that youth born again, and that campus person born again, that sister, that lady born again, that mother born again, don't you know that father born again, that member of the church is born again, don't you know that he or she is the temple of God and that the spirit of God dwelleth in you, dwelleth in a child of God. Look at verse 17. In verse 17, if any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. For the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. Look at that word, underline that word in your Bible, defile, defile. If any man defile the temple of God. You see that word defile, the Corinthians might not have understood. 
because some of them are from Jewish background and some of them also from Gentile background. And there are many people today, uh, they're just walking and walking and walking and they do not understand if any man, and God is no respecter of persons. God is not a partial God. If any man, call him an apostle. If any man, call him a pastor. If any man, call him by whatever title, an overseer. If any man, call her a counselor. Call her an advisor. Call her a mother in Israel. Call her by any title. If anyone defile the temple of God, him, her, shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. Now, what did, what standard is God going to use? Is Christ going to use on the day of reckoning on that word defiled? Come to Mark chapter 7, reading from verse 21. Mark chapter 7, verse 21. In the case of the, of the Jewish people, they think that if you are going to eat, if you don't wash your hands, you are defiled. If you don't wash the cup, you are defiled. If you don't wash the containers of whatever, you are defiled. But Jesus said, for from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders. Verse 22, in verse 22, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness and evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. Verse 23, all these evil things come from within and defile the man, and defile the man. If as a minister, your actions, your counseling, your answers to questions will make people to go towards those things that defile according to the doctrine of Christ. Then if anyone defiles the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. In Hebrews chapter 12, reading from verse 15. Hebrews chapter 12, reading from verse 15. Looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God. Let's look at this. Any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. When the word of God says, if any man defiles the temple of God, it's not just talking about the sins of the flesh. It's talking about bitterness. You know, you can poison people's mind against constituted authority. Authority in the world that's government, authority at home, fathers and mothers. You can poison the minds of children against their parents, father and mother. Authority in the church, the leadership of the church. You can poison people's minds and you can sow the seed of bitterness and the root of bitterness. And it says the root of bitterness springing up will defile many. And if anyone will defile the church of God by planting seed of bitterness and the root of bitterness in the hearts of people in the church, him shall God destroy. This is not a person now that will be saved so as by fire the people that do not have anything against uh, the foundation and they build on the foundation. Only what they were building did not make people to grow, did not add positively to their lives. They'll be saved so as by fire. There'll be no reward for them. But the people that defile the children of God and the church of God, the people that sow be bitterness in the hands of people, he shall God destroy. In Revelation chapter 21, we're reading from verse 8. Revelation chapter 21, we're reading here from verse 8. But the fearful and the unbelieving and the abominable and the murderers and all mongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second 
second death. And then in verse 27, in verse 27, it tells us there, in verse 27, looking at all that defiles the people, it says, and there shall in no wise enter into it anything that defileth. All those things were read about in verse 8, they are the things that defile, and it says, there shall in no wise enter into heaven anything that defileth, neither whatsoever worketh abomination or maketh a lie, but they which are rich in in the Lamb's book of life. That's why we're called to boldness in ministry. You're a pastor, you need to be bold in the ministry so that you preserve the church of God, you preserve the temple of God, you preserve every individual member in the church of the living God, you preserve them from defilement and we need to pray that God will give us such boldness and such authority that we declare the word of God without fear and without favor. He tells us in 1 John chapter 4 verse 17, 1 John chapter 4 reading from verse 17 about the character and about the mindset of a person who is going to build on the foundation gold and, and silver and precious stone who is going to help and who is going to develop who is going to move forward the temple of the living God who is going to keep holy and keep righteous the temple of the living God herein is our love made possible that we may have boldness in the day of judgment because as he is so are we in this present world as he is as Christ would have been if we were here now he'll declare his word he'll declare the word of the father with boldness without fear without favor he'll want to bring everyone that comes to him bring them into the righteousness of God into the holy nature of God as he is so are we in this present world we we'll come to point number three now Point number three is the foolishness residing in all worldly wise members. We're coming to First Corinthians chapter three, reading from verse eighteen. First Corinthians chapter three, verse eighteen. Let no man deceive you. Let no man, because of his office, deceive you. Let no man, because of his popularity deceive you let no man because of his ability to communicate even when he's communicating error let no man deceive you let no man because of his bold face very aggressive and can do whatever let no man deceive you if any man among you seem to be wise in this world let him become a fool let him accept that without the wisdom of God without the word of God is nothing and he has nothing let him become a fool that he may be wise in verse 19 in verse 19 it says for the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God the wisdom people acquire in the world of literature in the world of politics in the world of management in the world of this and that all that wisdom we cannot bring that into the church and lead the church with the wisdom of the world without the spirit of god for the wisdom of this world is foolishness with god for it is written he taketh the wise in their craftiness and then in verse 20 in verse 20 it tells us that again the Lord knoweth the thoughts of the wise that they are vain verse 21 verse 21 then says therefore let no man glory in men whether Paul or Apollos or Severs or Titus or Timothy or any other man an apostle a prophet an evangelist a pastor a teacher therefore let no man glory in men for all 
all things are yours. And then in verse 22, it tells us whether Paul or Apollos or Sivas or the world or life or death or things present or things to come, all are yours. And then in verse 23, it says, and ye are Christ's and Christ is God and Christ is God's. Look at three things here. Number one, the foolishness of the worldly wise critics. The foolishness of the worldly wise critics. That's why it says in chapter 3, verses 18 and 19, how foolish the people of the world, the wisdom of the world, the wisdom they acquire by the proverbs of the world, principles of the pattern of the world, and the wisdom they acquire in the literature of the world. Let no man deceive himself. Let no man deceive himself. If any man among you seem to be wise in this world, let him become a fool that he may be wise. Then verse 19, in verse 19 it says, For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God, for it is written, it taketh the wise in their own craftiness. He wants us to have the wisdom of God, not the wisdom of the people of the world. That's why he says in Galatians chapter 6, verse 3, Galatians chapter 6, reading from verse 3, it says, For if a man think himself to be something, when he is nothing, he doesn't have assurance of salvation, is nothing, he doesn't have the Spirit of God guiding, controlling, influencing him, is nothing, he doesn't have the, the, the alert you know, of the Holy Spirit that is guiding him and it is checking him. Don't go that way, don't do that thing. He doesn't have the checks of the Spirit of God in his life, he is nothing. He doesn't have Christ living big in his life and he doesn't have the Almighty God speaking to him every time this is the way to go and this is not the way to go and yet he thinks himself to be something if a man think himself to be something when he is nothing he deceives himself i pray you'll not deceive yourself i said i pray you'll not deceive yourself Let's look at number two here. Number two here is talking about the fruitlessness of worldly witchy contenders. The contenders who contend against the word of God. The critics who contend against the word of God. The argumentators, the debaters who contend against the word of God. Their lives are fruitless. Whatever they say, whatever they do, they cannot get souls convicted of their sin and they cannot get souls driven to their knees to pray for salvation and they cannot bring transformation in the lives of people and make them to decide and make them to consecrate and make them to go the way of the Lord and live a better life and live a transformed life but they criticize sound doctrine they criticize the word of God and yet what they want to bring in replacement to that does not transform transform any life the fruitlessness of the worldly witchy contender it tells us in first corinthians chapter 3 and verse 20 first corinthians chapter 3 verse 20 and again the lord knoweth the thoughts of the wise that they are vain the lord knows the thoughts of the worldly wise that they are vain they are wise beyond scripture they're wise beyond revelation. They're wise beyond Christ. They're wise beyond the doctrines of the Bible. They're wise beyond the revelation of the word of God that leads us into intimate, close fellowship with God. All the thoughts of those worldly, worldly wise people, they are vain. It tells us in chapter 2, verse 6. First Corinthians chapter 2. We're reading from verse 6. It tells us, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, reading from verse 6, albeit we speak wisdom 
among them which are perfect, yet not the wisdom of this world, not the wisdom of this world, nor of the princes of this world that come to naught. The wisdom of the people of this world that come to naught. They cannot lead to salvation that come to naught. They cannot lead us to sanctification that come to naught. They cannot lead us to surrender, absolute surrender unto God that come to naught. The wisdom of this world cannot make us to have more of the grace of God and to live the victorious life those things come to naught. I pray that your life will not be based on nothingness in Jesus' name. Did I hear your amen? amen? Number three is the fullness, the fullness of the wise by the word Christians. The Christians who are made wise by the word. They look at the word of God and on the basis of the word of God, that's how they become wise. It says in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, reading from verse 21, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 21, Therefore, let no man glory in men, for all things are yours. All things are yours. All things provided at Calvary. All things are yours. All things provided by Christ. All things are yours. All things promised by the Lord. All things are yours. All things provision in the kingdom of God. All things are yours. All things that depend on faith. All things are yours. All things that we go on our knees and we get from the Lord by prayer. All things are yours. It says in verse 22, it says, whether, whether Paul or Apollos or Sabers or the world or life or death or things present or things to come, all are yours. Look at eight things there. Number one, all things are yours, Paul. Number one, all things are yours, Apollos. Number two, all things are yours, Sivas. Number three, all things are yours. Number four, with the world, all things are yours. Number five, life, all things are yours. Number six, death, all things are yours. Things present. Number eight, all things are yours. All things are yours. What's he talking about when he says? all things are yours and then he mentions Paul is talking about Paul's revelation all the revelation that God gave to Paul the apostle he says everything is yours it was given to Paul not to hurt and not to only hold to himself it was given to him so that he can reveal unto you Paul's revelation yours and Apollo's refortification it is Apollo's and when he comes he gets the people to be strengthened in the way of the Lord. He refortifies them and he says all things belonging to Apollos to refortify you. All things are yours. And he says recollection, the resources of Peter. He was with the Lord Jesus Christ and all the recollection of Peter and all the resources of Peter. Everything is made available unto you. Why would you live like an orphan? Why would you live for somebody that does not have revelation, refortification, or resources, or recollection. In fact, it says, even the world's reconciliation that the Lord Jesus Christ has given himself, that the world will be reconciled unto him, and the world's reconciliation, that belongs to you too. You've been in the world, you can be reconciled unto God. And then he tells us, even the things belonging unto life, the refreshment of life life's refreshing all the promises that God has given to refresh your life to renew your life to recreate your life all things are yours and he says even the restraints of death the restraints of death also that be belongs to you when you remember that death is coming and that restrains you and you know it may come today it may come to tomorrow and even death 
death is serving you as a restraint the restraints of death and the things present present responsibilities all things are yours and the future the realization of the future he says all things are yours and then he says everything when you sum up everything together the redemption in Christ all things are yours the righteousness of Christ all things are yours and the riches of Christ all things are yours and ye are Christ and Christ is God's the Lord has revealed to us today that we need to come back to the very foundation the foundation of Christ our Savior foundation of Christ our sanctifier foundation of Christ our shepherd foundation of Christ the final sacrifice foundation of Christ the Lord and the King foundation of Christ the mediator and the advocate foundation of Christ the word the living word and the final word and it says if you have been built on this foundation keep on building keep on building and you're going to build in the lives of other people let it remain on that foundation grow as you are established in that foundation of the Lord I pray that the grace the same grace God gave to Paul the Apostle and the same strength and the same faith God gave to those worthies of old the Lord will impart into your life all right the Lord will impart into my life all things will be yours in Jesus name amen so weak amen that will be more grace into your life let us rise up now let us rise up now and receive more of the grace of God and more of the faith in the living word and more of everything we ought to have as we build on the foundation of the Lord Jesus Christ pray so that something greater something higher will be added into your life your Christian life and your Christian ministry today